Well, there you have it, backing up and trying again. I'm Shepard Smith in New York, reshaping the message she was, one already delivered by President Trump. Yesterday, the president added an apostrophe T to a word, and the White House tried to act like the message had changed. It did not. Today, when asked whether Russia is still targeting the United States, the president said no. Just now, the press secretary said something else. Here's Sarah Sanders. You had a chance to speak with the president after uh, his comments, and the president was said thank you very much and was saying no to answering questions. He wasn't asked if he would answer questions. He was asked specifically if Russia is still targeting the United States, and he said no. The truth is recorded. Why he says one thing and then his White House attempts to change it, we really don't know. Is Russia still Let's targeting the way. U.S.? Is Russia still targeting the U.S., Mr. President? Thank Press. You Let's go. Make your way out. No, you don't think that to be the case. Let's go. The reporter who asked the question and witnesses in the room says there was no doubt he was answering the question. This goes directly against what his top intelligence official has said repeatedly, including last week. In regards to state actions, Russia has been the most aggressive foreign actor, no question. And they continue their efforts to undermine our democracy. They continue their efforts to undermine our democracy. The director of national intelligence, Dan Coats, said the digital infrastructure that serves this country is literally under attack and one of the worst offenders is Russia. Dan Coates, who served in the military, former senator, former representative in Congress, a man who told Barack Obama, you must sanction the Russians because of their invasion and takeover of Crimea. You must. Dan Coates said that. This is part of a pattern. One thing is said at the White House and then it's changed in another setting. First, the president trashed the British Prime Minister Theresa May in public. Then the White House uh, backed it up before she barely survived a challenge in Parliament. Just yesterday, as you heard, it happened again regarding a statement the president made during his summit with President Vladimir Putin. About 27 hours, half a dozen tweets, and two interviews after that statement, President Trump claimed he used the word would instead of the word wouldn't when he said, I don't see any reason why it would be Russia interfering in the American democracy. In context, his message was perfectly clear, and adding an NT to one word did not change the meaning. He said both sides were to blame. He said there could be other hackers and interferers in the election. He said Putin was very strong and powerful in his denial. Again, part of a pattern. Say one thing, change it later, sort of. Fallout from that summit continues on Capitol Hill. Some lawmakers say they're considering new sanctions against Moscow. And the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, is set to testify on this matter next week. What happened in the meeting with Putin? We do not know. Lawmakers from both parties say they want to know what happened in that closed door meeting. 130 minutes, two hours, 10 minutes between the president and Vladimir Putin. Of course, Pompeo wasn't in the room, so he can only testify about what the president told him about the meeting. So some on Capitol Hill are asking that the interpreter who is said to have been there when it all happened, that that interpreter be called to Capitol Hill to testify on Capitol Hill. What happened in the meeting? Did President Trump make any agreements with Putin? We don't know. Did he make any promises? Did he offer any confessions? We do not know. We'll have the latest from the Hill and on those efforts in just a moment. First, Peter Ducey who's on Fox Top Story live at the White House. Peter, the pattern continues. Say one thing, back it up and try to change it. Right, and today was a case where unlike yesterday where the president came out and he said, you know what, I checked the transcript, uh, that is not exactly what I meant. Today, Sarah Sanders said uh, she was standing in, in the room, in the cabinet room with the president when a lot of the reporters here believed him to say in response to a question, no, he does not think Russia is still, uh, the Russian threat to undermine American democracy is ongoing. He was just saying, no, I don't want to answer any questions anymore. And so the White House says that is that. And Sarah Sanders says this is different, that she is not uh, trying to overturn or trying to reverse what President Trump said. She is instead just interpreting what he said differently and she says uh, that that is also based on a conversation that she had with him, that he was just saying, no, I don't want to answer any more questions. Something else that the White House is trying to do right now is make sure that everybody in this room remembers that uh, despite some of the comments and how people interpret them differently, the record and the way that they deal with Russia shows something else. Well, he does believe that they 
would target certainly U.S. elections again. Between the president and the DNI codes who said the red lights are blinking on this topic. Do they no, as I agree? just said, that's why we're taking steps to ensure that these things don't happen again. We wouldn't actually spend as much time and effort as we are if we didn't believe that they were still looking at us. So the White House press secretary is saying that regardless of what was said, how reporters understood it, how it is being reported, uh, just to look at the record, they think that that uh, gives them all the proof that they would need. And President Trump, uh, in the cabinet room earlier, surrounded by his entire cabinet, the secretaries of all the major departments, uh, and America's top diplomats, he said essentially the same thing, that he thinks that his record is better than Barack Obama, George Bush, or anybody else that came before. Listen. We're doing very well, uh, probably as well as anybody has ever done with Russia. And there's been no president ever as tough as I have been on Russia. All you have to do is look at the numbers, look at what we've done, look at sanctions, look at ambassadors uh, not there, look, unfortunately, at what happened in Syria recently. Uh, and I think President Putin knows that better than anybody, certainly a lot better than the media. He understands it, and he's not happy about it, and he shouldn't be happy about it. Something else that Sarah Sanders revealed at the end of her briefing before she walked back into her office, she does not know of any kind of a recording that exists from that one-on-one -on -one meeting between President Trump and Vladimir Putin. Shep. Hey, Peter, you asked about the effort from some lawmakers to hear from the interpreter who, who we're told at least was in the room as Putin and, and President Trump were speaking. Right. The American interpreter who was helping President Trump communicate with Putin has not been heard from, uh, at least not publicly. And so some lawmakers who do not take President Trump at his word on Capitol Hill, on the Democratic side of the aisle, want to, bring, want to subpoena her and make her either confirm or deny whether or not what President Trump is saying is true. I asked Sanders if that is something that she could ever get behind. She told us to ask the State Department. Haven't had a chance to do that just yet, Chuck. Peter Ducey, live in the briefing room. Peter, thanks very much. Uh, we're going to hear from Tara Mahler in just a moment uh, on what Russia's actual efforts are to target the United States. They are ongoing. Dan Coates, the director of national intelligence, makes that perfectly clear. We'll talk about the danger uh, for you, me, the democracy, and the rest as Fox News Channel's coverage continues in just a moment.
Uh, during the news conference just a moment ago, there was another nugget that we want to bring up now that we've moved past the, the double speak and the backtracking. There's the matter of two men whom the President of the United States spoke with uh, about with, with Vladimir Putin. One of them is a financier named Bill Browder. Bill Browder is one who was tied up with, the, there he is, the Majins Majinsky Act, uh, which essentially ties up a lot of Vladimir Putin's money in the United States. Uh, the Magnitsky Act from 20, 000, uh, 2012, designed to sanction Russians suspected of carrying out human rights offenses and stop their assets from leaving the country. So that affects uh, Vladimir Putin. In addition, amb U.S. Ambassador Michael McFaul uh, who was an ambassador and is an outspoken critic of President, of President Putin. Putin has said that he wants the opportunity to prosecute those two. Well, it's one thing for him to say that, but then the president today, we learned from, from Sarah Sanders, has to speak with his national security team on that before deciding whether the, those two would be given up for prosecution. Well, that's our understanding of what Sarah Sanders just said. Uh, for more now on Russia's efforts to inter undermine American democracy, let democracy, let's bring in Tara Mahler, former CIA military analyst, currently a spokesperson for the, and senior policy advisor, that is, for the counter-extremism project. This matter of giving up people in the United States for prosecution in Russia is insanity. You, you, you don't give up a former ambassador to the United States to the, for the Russians to prosecute. We all know what that could end up with. And that Sarah Sanders would say he needs to speak with his national security team was a, was a trigger for me. Did you hear that? I did hear that, and what is the real insanity of all this is that we still don't know, as you said earlier, what was said, what was promised, what was exchanged in that one-on-one -on -one meeting. There's calls now from Capitol Hill, not just to have Secretary Pompeo come up to the Hill to talk through this, but the translator in the room from the State Department. This is extremely problematic from a U.S. foreign policy perspective because you're getting divergent stories and narratives out of the White House, which don't seem to converge with what is happening, for example, in the press conference. Sarah Sanders did walk through some elements of what happened in Helsinki, but it's not clear that she really has insight into exactly what happened in that meeting. And you're absolutely right. You know, if the president did broach that topic with Putin, what else did he broach with, with Putin in that guaranteed? How was it said? Again, the whole Helsinki summit to me was an example of how not to conduct diplomacy with an adversary. It's a really good case study, and I'm all for engaging with our adversaries, just not in that fashion. It, it, sure, past presidents have spoken with Putin repeatedly, and, but when you have a meeting like this, normally there's a secretary of state, there's a note taker, there's a transcriber, that sort of thing, and President Trump could have had that if that's what he had wanted. He didn't want that. Obviously, the Russians didn't want it. But it would, would it be normal or abnormal for the Russians to have some sort of a, a recording or transcript of such a conversation? So it's possible that they could have attempted to do that. I'm not sure the security mechanisms that were in place from both sides in terms of screening people or the participants as they came into the room from the U.S. side. Obviously, for security purposes, security was high. So I don't know what precautionary measures were taken by both sides. So it is possible. Having said that, I'm surprised somebody on the Trump administration side didn't talk to President Trump to convince him that it's to his benefit Who to says have they somebody didn't else try. in the room. I, I, hear they, I hear that many close aides wanted him to have, to have a witness, wanted him to have someone in there, but he, so he didn't want it. So the question is then, why not? Because it protects you as well. It protects the words that you say. It protects your credibility because Putin can come out and say whatever he wants was said in that meeting, right? The Russian press, controlled by the government, can come out and say that President Trump said X, Y, and Z. They can spin what he said, and there's no way to really push back against that. So there's a major credibility crisis on both sides, regardless of what was said in that meeting, and for the purposes of historical record as well. It's, it's, it's problematic. I mean, I really think that this, the whole summit from beginning to end was not just problematic in terms of the content, but you see the White House now is basically immersed in trying to clean up and backpedal what the policy discussions actually were and what the United States positions are on key issues. These aren't light issues, Syria, North Korea. I mean, these are serious issues, Russian meddling in the election. You had the DNI come out with a statement following a presidential press conference refuting the president. And this is not a partisan matter because you have Republicans calling for Secretary Pompeo to clarify and criticizing the president as well. They are indeed. Tara Mahler, thank you. Thank you. Some GOP lawmakers have criticized the president. Many did after his summit with Vladimir Putin. In fact, just about everyone who spoke, except maybe for Rand Paul. But our next guest explains why other Republicans are choosing just to stay quiet. 
even though they want to speak out. If they want to speak out, why don't they? That's coming up from the Fox News Deck on a Wednesday afternoon. President Trump is getting pushed back from members of his own party as the White House spends another day trying to walk back his comments about Russia. As I mentioned earlier today, the president said no when a reporter asked whether Russia is still targeting the United States election. Russia is still targeting our elections. Moments ago, the press secretary, Sarah Sanders, claimed the president said no to a question that, do you want to answer any more questions? No one asked him that question. This just one day after President Trump said he misspoke when he questioned U.S. intelligence findings during his news conference with Vladimir Putin. South Carolina Senator the Republican Lindsey Graham, who often defends the president, called his latest comments perplexing. This is a big deal for the country. I believe the Russians are going to continue to do this until they, until they pay a heavier price. But I believe the intelligence community assessment about what's happening in 2018. I'd like to hear more specifically from the president why he doesn't uh, agree with them. Senator Graham says President Trump needs to clear this up, and that's a quote. Our chief congressional correspondent, Mike Emanuel, is live on the Hill. Hello, Mike. Good afternoon to you. Democrats are pouncing here on Capitol Hill, including Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer saying, quote, Mr. President, it is time to stop taking the word of a KGB agent over that of your own intelligence officials. Russia interfered in our 2016 elections. They're actively trying to do it again. You must wake up to that fact. Other Democrats say there must be a congressional response. That includes Senator Patrick Leahy, who says, at the very least, there should be some kind of resolution saying that the U.S. Congress favors the U.S. intelligence community over the word of Vladimir Putin. And so a lot of lawmakers here on Capitol Hill say there must be some kind of response from lawmakers, uh, but it's not entirely clear with an election four months away whether Republicans and Democrats in the House and Senate can get together and go in the same direction at this stage. We know, of course, that Democrats in both the House and Senate are calling to hear from President Trump's American interpreter to see what was said in that private Putin-Trump meeting, Shep. And privately, do Republicans want to know what happened in that meeting as well, or are they not interested in that? No, I think they definitely want to know what went on in that meeting, and they're also trying to get a sense of what's going on over at the White House. Again, they're waiting to see, basically, let Sarah Sanders clean up the mess uh, with the president's comment today that a lot of people took to say, aha, he's going against the intelligence community once again. A senior GOP lawmaker earlier today praised the president for admitting yesterday that he misspoke. I heard what he said last night, and I uh, didn't hear the same thing in the news conference. I think we ought to look at it from this standpoint. A uh, president that apologizes for what he said, uh, it's, a, it's a gentlemanly thing to do, and we ought to applaud him for it, not find fault with it. Other Repub Republicans here on Capitol Hill have called for more sanctions against Moscow to send a signal to Moscow. The House Speaker was very clear yesterday in saying that he thinks the Russian government is a menacing government. Shep. Mike, thank you. Elena Treen now, a reporter for Axios Live on Capitol Hill. Are they going to get to hear from this, in, this interpreter who was in the room and, you know, they, they have a responsibility to take notes and know what's happening in there, or is that not going to happen? Uh, 
It's unclear right now. Um, my reporting, I haven't really had any reporting on whether the White House will agree or the interpreter will agree to come to the Hill and speak with lawmakers. But I assume that uh, the White House probably wants to keep it quiet. Um, and just looking forward with uh, what some of these lawmakers are saying, uh, I think it's really interesting to note that you look at what happened on Monday, that the press conference was a disaster. And, you know, that's the assessment of both the GOP and the president's allies. And now, uh, now that the dust has settled and it's been 48 hours, now Republicans are starting to kind of dial back that criticism like we just saw with uh, Chuck Grassley on the on camera just then. What about this matter of Ambassador McFaul uh, and the United Kingdom citizen who, who tied in with Majinski Act? What about them being turned over that he needs to speak with his national security team about whether the, the Russians will be allowed to question and, I don't know, prosecute them or whatever they want to do? Well, um, so the president said it was an interesting idea. Um, Obviously, a lot of critics, and we saw this on Monday, said this is a ridiculous uh, thing to say. It's an interesting idea or to even propose as uh, something that could happen. Um, because really, you know, what Putin had, attempt, I guess, proposed was that Mueller would be able to go over to Russia and see the interview process with those 12 people that were indicted. And then Russia would, in return, come to the U.S. and be able to interview uh, or see the interviews going on with U.S. officials involved in the Mueller investigation, which clearly, from um, a U.S. standpoint, isn't something that would be beneficial to the United States. And, and, and finally, on this, say one thing, then try to change it to another thing, at least partially, trying to have it. It feels like trying to have it both ways. I mean, the, the effect is that they're getting to have it both ways, because if you want to believe he said one thing, then you have it. And if you want to believe he said something else, I, I wonder how that plays on Capitol Hill and in foreign capitals, for that matter. Well, it's it's not a great look to say, you know, come back the next day, 24 hours after seeing all of this sharp backlash from both parties, both Democrats and Republicans, and then say, I misspoke. Um, yes, the president should clarify if he thinks he misspoke. But uh, that's a huge deal, especially when you're dealing with a foreign leader um, and in a press conference where you're addressing the world. And I think that this is going to be something that we should keep an eye on and see if the president continues. But at the same time, Republicans are very hesitant to call out the president because they recognize that doing so isn't really beneficial to them. So we're kind of seeing zero accountability for what the president says and does right now. Lana Treen uh, from Axios, good to see you, thanks. Thanks for having me. President Trump and the First Lady traveling to Joint Base Andrews today to pay their respects to a fallen soldier, or I should say a former member of the, a fallen member of the Secret Service. White House officials say Special Agent Noel Remigan, Noel Remigan died after he had a stroke in Scotland. He was on the president's security team. He was also a Marine and had worked as a member of the Secret Service for nearly two decades. The agency tweeted, this week the U.S. Secret Service lost one of America's finest. We ask for your thoughts and prayers for his family, friends, and colleagues, forever worthy of trust and confidence. An accused Russian spy in court today. Ahead, what we're learning about the woman prosecutors say gathered intelligence on Americans, offered sex for a job, and so much more. Plus, a woman ends up riding her bike over an open drawbridge. The rest of the video, straight away. I'm Leah Gabriel with the Fox Report. A woman on a bicycle rode onto a bridge as it was opening and fell right into the gap. This happened in Menasha in eastern Wisconsin. You can see there as she missed the warning gates, she almost completely disappears into the crack. 
Some folks ran to help the woman who had some facial injuries. Police told a local station alcohol may be involved. And a dust devil ripped through a festival in northwestern France, sending tables and tents flying. This happened Sunday, but we just got this video. A witness said the storm destroyed dozens of stands and that thankfully there weren't large crowds because people were watching the World Cup elsewhere. And a rare animal sighting caught on video in Montana. Check out these baby wolverines and their mama. A wildlife group had been monitoring the mother while she was pregnant. Wolverines, a member of the weasel family, scientists estimate fewer than 300 live in the lower 48. Shep, we'll be right back. Do you know which investment could be? Coming up in the next 30 minutes on Fox News Channel, the cave kids of Thailand talk to reporters for the first time. They speak about their underground ordeal. Lawmakers are considering some tax law changes that could shake up your retirement plans. We'll tell you about that. And you'll hear from the Marine who got a car from his boss after demonstrating a worth ethic that's way above and beyond. That's in the next half hour right here. First, though, at the top of the news at the bottom of the hour, breaking now. The Russian woman accused of being a spy on U.S. soil and taking orders from a high-level official at the Kremlin has pleaded not guilty. Maria Butina is her name. She made her first court appearance moments ago. Prosecutors say she was gathering intelligence on American officials and trying to set up secret communications with Moscow. The Fed say she co-funded, or I should say, co-founded a Russian gun rights group supported by an ally of Vladimir Putin to build ties with the NRA and conservative politicians in the United States. Prosecutors say she offered an American sex in exchange for a job at a special interest organization. Her lawyer says she's not a Russian agent and that the accusations are overblown. Our national security correspondent, Jennifer Griffin, live with the news from the Pentagon. Hi, Jen. Hi, Shepard. Well, we've just gotten some details from inside the courtroom. The judge denied Maria Butina's request to appear in civilian clothes at the hearing. She pled not guilty, and the judge ordered her held without bond. Her lawyer says she was just here to set up a U.S.-Russia friendship society. He said he was she was simply a Russian grad student at American University in Washington, D.C. At least one Republican congressman has come to her defense. Butina arranged a meeting between between her Russian mentor, Alexander Torshin, the billionaire deputy treasury minister and Putin ally in Moscow with Republican Congressman Dana Rohrbacher during a congressional delegation trip. Both she and Torshin also hosted senior NRA members in Moscow as well. Rohrbacher came to her defense in a statement to Politico, quote, it's ridiculous, it's stupid. She's the assistant of some guy who is the head of the bank and is a member of their parliament. That's what we call a spy. That shows how just how bogus this whole thing is. Russia's foreign minister just tweeted a statement calling the allegations against Butina uh, far-fetched, quote, it looks as if the FBI, instead of carrying out their responsibility of fighting crime, is implementing a political put-up job set to it by forces that are whipping up anti-Russia hysteria in the U.S., Shep. Funny that that came from Dana Rohrbacher. He's often seen as mighty tight with Vladimir Putin, isn't he? He certainly has spent a lot of time in Moscow of late. Yes. Tell, tell us more. This is a live picture from the courthouse there. The accusations are, are highly detailed against this woman. It's, it's not as if they're just guessing here. In fact, there was a very detailed affidavit and indictment. She entered the U.S. on a student visa to study at American University, not far from the Russian embassy, three months before the presidential election in 2016. The FBI began tailing her almost immediately. She had been coming to the U.S. for the past four years. She cozied up to powerful Republicans, attending campaign events and the CPAC conference. In 2013, she began attending NRA events after establishing a gun rights group in Moscow called called Right to Bear Arms. She hosted American gun enthusiasts in Russia. One delegation included Milwaukee Sheriff David Clark. 
She began a romantic relationship with Paul Erickson, a South Dakota-based GOP operative who was 27 years her senior. In private communications, her Moscow handler compared her to the high-profile spy Anna Chapman arrested in the U.S. in 2010, that according to the affidavit. The Justice Department has convinced the judge that she is a severe flight risk. Shep. Jen, thank you. Let's turn to Emily Campagno now, former federal attorney and former criminal defense attorney who's live with us. How serious are these charges against uh, Butina? These charges are extremely serious, and I note as well that the government in that court filing was very clear that this is not a sole subject investigation. The government wrote, look, after this arrest, we will return to our investigation, meaning there are multiple subjects. So it's important for viewers to understand that to stay tuned because more will be revealed as well as potentially identification of these additional subjects. It, it, I, the details I thought were very interesting. The prosecutor said that when they went to her place, Remember, if you're a Russian national, all you have to do is go into the Russian embassy and they can ship you back to Russia. And that's the reason they're saying, look, we don't want bond for this woman. When they went to her house, she had boxes packed up. Uh, she has a long networking history with Americans and clear communications, according to intelligence agencies, clear continued at over a long period of time communications with Russians. Exactly. And here are a few additional things that I'd like to highlight for viewers. So essentially, she, what is alleged to have occurred is that she, along with her mentor, Alexander Torshin, that they sought back channels into the U.S. government, that it's not just about influencing or aligning themselves with the GOP and uh, the NRA and other corporate interests and American politician interests. These were actual offers of bona fide benefits. So some random ones include, for example, Vladimir Putin attending the 2017 National Prayer Breakfast. They include uh, pro-Russia conferences. These were concerted efforts that go beyond just simple cultivation, cultivation of relationships. I note as well that interestingly in the DMs between her mentor and herself, they talk about why the GOP was so valuable to them, why it was all about targeting Republicans and a Republican president rather than Democrats. And they said, well, Democrats are definitely against Russia and we are only hope of aligned social interests are with the GOP. But remember when the Magnitsky Act was introduced before Congress almost 10 years ago, that was under the Obama administration. Administration. And because of thawing relationships with Russia, that's why Obama didn't want that to pass. So again, under a Democratic president, um, I note as well that they said, look, have patience and cold blood, her mentor said to her. So, you know, you'll win the war, not the battle. So again, this was an extremely detailed, drawn out investigation. And much more ahead on it. Emily Campagna, thank you. The young soccer players who were st stuck inside a cave in Thailand for more than two weeks say when they heard rescuers coming, they weren't sure it was real. The team and their coach are now out of the hospital, and today, and for the very first time, they spoke about what happened. The kids had a chance to kick a soccer ball today for the cameras, but some of the Thai Navy SEALs who rescued them uh, could, get, could not get enough. They said until the divers reached them, they had no food, only a trickle of water inside, uh, uh, off a rock inside that cave. The one player who spoke English says he didn't know what to say when divers found him, so he just said hello. Benjamin Hall, live with the news now. Benjamin? Yeah, Shep, and the, the truth is that uh, only a couple more days and they may not have survived this ordeal. They were very close to dying of malnourishment when they were found. As you say, they had a little bit of water, they had no food, and they had a torch. They managed to conserve those for the, the duration of their horrific stay in this cave. But by the end of their ordeal, as before rescuers arrived, they had been fainting from hunger. They were very weak, and they described how they tried to stay strong by meditating, by trying to control their breathing to conserve oxygen, and crucially, they kept each other motivated. Okay, to everyone, okay, to a fight, okay, not to um, defeat. They also paid special tribute to Sanan Kunan today. He was the Thai Navy SEAL who died while trying to rescue them, saying that his sacrifice wouldn't be forgotten. And they plan to honor Kunan by entering the monkhood for a period of time. And they also said that they felt responsible for his death and that they shared in the pain of his family. Shep? What are doctors saying about the guys? How are they doing? Well, a remarkable recovery, frankly. Some of them had some infections, some had pneumonia. But moving forward, as they go back to their families, one of the toughest things will be the mental recovery. They've gone through such an ordeal for people so very young, but they say they're going to go out together. They're going to go on a holiday together soon. They're going to try and recover as a group. So they're saying now they're going to live life to the fullest. Back to you. Benjamin Hall, live in London. Thank you. Breaking news now, a house, the House has passed a resolution 
supporting U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. We'll head to Capitol Hill for the details on that straight away. New Day USA is The breaking news now, the House has passed a non-binding resolution to support U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. It's about the division, not the work it does. Some Democrats have called for the agency itself to be abolished after the separation of immigrant families at the border. Our senior Capitol Hill producer, Chad Pergram, is live up on the Hill. This has become a bit of a political football up there, huh? Absolutely. And Democrats last week, Mark Pocan, who's a Democrat from Wisconsin, put forth a bill that would have abolished ICE. And so Republicans said, we'll call your bluff, we'll put it on the floor. They changed that plan, and what they did today was a non-binding resolution to basically say, we like ICE, we appreciate all the things they've done. And the House has just voted in the past few minutes here, 244 to 135, to affirm that they appreciate what ICE does. Uh, they needed 186 votes to, to get this. this. They needed a two-thirds vote here. But here's the interesting thing, Shep. There were 133 Democrats who voted present. In other words, they didn't weigh in. And all the nays there, 135, those were all from Democrats. One Republican, Justin Amash, he voted no. Chad Pergram on the Hill, thank you for the update on the breaking news there. Lawmakers on the Hill are also working on what could be the biggest change, change to retirement savings in more than a decade. Deirdre Bolton's here from the biz to give us details on that. What's uh, up here? Am. Well, the idea, at least my take, is that the government is actually worried that Americans haven't saved enough for retirement. Our mm -hmm. colleagues at the Wall Street Journal did an amazing piece. Uh, they published it. Retirement bills in Congress could alter 401k plans. So if these changes go through, it would be the biggest changes since 2006. But what would be different? One thing is that you as an employee would actually get more information about the annuity. Basically, it would show you monthly what your payment would would be from your 401k. Oh, that's interesting. My take is that people say like, oh, you know, maybe $200,000 sounds like a lot, but then when you see it broken down month to month over the rest of your life after mm -hmm. 70, maybe you think, okay, that's actually not a lot and I need to save more. Uh, That'd the be good other information thing, to have. It would be great information yeah. to have. The other thing is they want to make it easier for smaller employers to mm -hmm. do auto deductions. Right now, it's just, it's heavy, it's cumbersome, it costs them a lot of money. Big companies like this can auto do it. Oh, automatic deductions. From people, oh, I see hey, what you mean. Um, make it easier for smaller companies to do mm -hmm. that. And then the last, um, make it easier. If you need money for an emergency, something comes up, they say, you know what? A lot of people actually don't put as much money as possible into their retirement accounts because they're afraid they might need cash. And once it's there, it's so hard to get it out. Huh. Very interesting. When do they make these decisions? So towards the end of the year, 50-50, to be honest, whether uh -huh. it will go through or not. Um, but there are a lot of people saying, listen, this has a lot of bipartisan support. All right. Uh, much more on this on Fox Business Network right up the dial and at foxbusiness.com. Thank you. Coming up, you'll hear from a Marine who says he tried to walk 20 miles to work because he didn't have a car. His story and how he wound up with brand new wheels. That's next.
A shark bite at the beach happened near the Hamptons in Fire Island. Cops in New York say they're warning folks who are heading there to watch out for the sharks after two people ended up with bites. Happened late this morning, just before noon, on Fire Island, east end of the city. One of the victims, a 13-year-old boy, were told, who was on a boogie board at the time, he went to the hospital. There were some pictures in the New York Post. A police source tells me, that, though I haven't seen it, uh, one cop down there tells me he may have gotten a tooth to the leg. Our friends at Fox 5 in New York say the second victim is a 12-year-old girl and that she got medical attention at the scene. Attacks happened just about a mile apart. No word on how many sharks they're dealing with. We also don't have any pictures of all that, but there were some scene pictures at the New York Post, which we own. Big reason police have, say, have bigger fish to fry. A little reminder that hard work does pay off. Did you hear about that college student in Alabama? His boss gave him a car after the guy had a heck of a commute on his first day to work. The employee, Walter Carr, says he set out to walk the 20 miles to work after his car broke down and he couldn't find a ride. He left his home around midnight to get to his job at a moving company a little before his shift started at 8 o'clock in the morning. Some police officers saw him about 14 miles into that trip and gave him a ride the rest of the way. They even took him to a Whataburger to get him some food. But then his boss hooked him up with a brand new set of wheels. Walter told Fox News, still unbelievable. You seriously? Like, you, like literally, like, you give me your car? <laughs> I was just like, oh, maybe you're going to get in the car, we're going to find a car myself. But for my boss to actually give me his car, it's, it's, I'm truly grateful and honored. I can't thank him enough. It works. A little more on the backstory of this college student. He's also a Marine. He and his mom lost their home during Hurricane Katrina. His boss at the moving company says he has heart and grit, just needed some wheels. And now he has them. Coming up, the man better known as Borat gets a surprise while trying to film his documentary show. We'll hear from a man who said he knew Sasha Baron Cohen was duping him. Just moments from now, that'll stream live on Facebook Watch. It's Fox News Update on Facebook Watch just minutes from now, right after this newscast on cable. Should news break out, we'll break in because breaking news changes everything on Fox News Channel. The final bell will ring on Wall Street in just about three minutes. Most of the arrows are up today, all but for just a tick early in the session. Neil Cavuto will have the final bell and all of the rest of the market news and your headlines in three minutes on Fox News Channel.